Welcome to Genuine Life Recovery. We're here to help you and your loved ones overcome addictions and other addiction-related mental health challenges. In this show, we dive into the physical, emotional, psychological, and spiritual aspects of addiction, mental health, recovery, family dynamics, codependency, and more. You can listen on your favorite app or at jodystevens.org. Genuine Life Recovery is made possible by great friends like Joshua's Heart in memory of Joshua Brent Moore, bringing hope, love, and awareness to those afflicted by addiction online at joshesheart.org and Jody Stevens Productions for commercial voiceover, narration, production, MC, and public speaking online at jodystevens.org. Hey friends, welcome back to Genuine Life Recovery. I'm excited for today. I'm joined by Michael Cassette. I love your last name. <laughs> uh, Michael is a retired pharmaceutical chemist, which is kind of cool. He is also a man of God, a man of science. So we're going to be kind of talking about meshing the two, God, science. We're going to be talking about recovery. We're going to be talking about the church. We're going to be talking about uh, Michael's work with addicts in recovery. And he's also going to share a little bit of his story of addiction and recovery as well. So Michael, I'm excited. Thank you so much for joining me on Genuine Life Recovery. Uh, thanks for inviting me. It's a great opportunity. Yeah, you have a very rich history, and we connected on LinkedIn. I posted something. I don't remember what. I can tell you, you what it is. It's how to stop okay. feeling powerless over addiction, sin, and life-controlling habits. Ah, you got it. Yeah, I got yeah. it. Of course, I did my research. But no, uh, you did. And uh, I made a comment that um, one of the things that I found in working with alcoholics is that in moving from the sort of a moral model to a medical model, we've lost yes. some of the um, moral responsibility and that, that there are a lot of people who are looking for that. That's sort of, I think, what sort of ignited a short exchange between us. Yes, it, it was so brilliant. And then the kind of conversation continued and I thought, this guy is super smart and I we have the video on even though we're not recording video and you totally look like a professor. <laughs> 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 and then you said, I'm so sorry, I had to say, and then you said, you know, you're a pharmaceutical chemist. And I'm like, this is going to be awesome. I like this guy's super smart, um, but also a Christian because we do like to do a biblical worldview. So anyway, I invited you on the show and I'm excited about that. And I can tell it's going to be a super fun conversation and that you're you're a brilliant guy. Talk to me before I want to hear some of your story, but talk to me about some of the work you you've done with addicts. I know you said you've been working with them for 40 years, which is a long time. So uh, in, in talking about this, I find it useful to remember um, that my work occurs is occurring at a specific time, which is uh -huh. uh, the 1980s to the 2020s, uh, at a specific place, which is the United States of America, and with uh -huh. a very specific group of addicts, uh, alcoholics, who have uh, joined the AA fellowship, self-identified, um, are willing to go to any lengths, have worked the program, attended the meetings, done what they were supposed to do, gotten their lives back, and yet are still suffering in their sobriety. Um, oh, that's goodness. the group yeah. um, overall, 40 years is a long time, uh, but that's the, yeah. the group that seems to be recurring. People who have done what was expected of them and what they wanted to do, and yet they still come up short in their life. And when I say suffering in their sobriety, uh, obviously there are a lot of secondary um, uh, psychological problems that need to be addressed. And we have a mental health care system who, when it's working well, can do that. But I'm talking yeah. more in the way a clinician would say iatrogenic. In other words, is there anything about the pairing of this person with this particular program and fellowship that is actually counterproductive? Uh, my sponsor mm. uh, was sponsored by Bill Wilson. Um, uh, so he came, wow. he came in in the 1940s. And they used to tell us, old timers, and I knew about half a dozen people who came in around the time the big book was published. And they used to tell us, remember that what works for you now when you come into AA, if you cling to it for too long, will eventually start stop working for you 
and maybe even start working against you. So you have to constantly oh grow and evolve. And yes, so yes. Uh, I would uh, come to meetings and talk to people. And my methodology was really simple um, to listen to what they had to say. For every hour I spend in the meeting, I'd spend four hours talking to them before or after the meeting, giving them a free space space to tell their story their way, you know, convert it to recovery speak. Um, you don't label it, you don't give them, but just let them tell their story their way. And um, it's it's from that that um, uh, I de- a large group of people still go to AA, um, work the program, work the fellowship to the best of their ability. And that's what I mean by suffering in their sobriety. It's still not working for them. And unfortunately, AA wasn't designed to address that. They didn't exist in, 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 uh, when Bill Wilson and, and the founders. They did, people who were suffering in their 12-step sobriety is a new class of people. And so the question is, what can we do to help them? And the first thing we do is by listening to them. Mm. I love that. That's brilliant. And I love that you said that because I believe it's initially, it's kind of like when you go into recovery and it's sort of like stabilize the patient, right? So initially it's going to be very helpful and we're going to get that support. But like you said, as we grow and evolve, AA is not designed to deal with all the underlying issues. Like I got sober through AA, but I was a super codependent. I had no sense of identity. I couldn't stand up for myself. I had all these other uh, problems with codependency or whatever you want to call it. But Um, And so it really was after doing a lot of digging and reading and all that stuff that I began to understand my real issues with codependency. That wasn't something AA could help me. Now I went to an Al-Anon meeting and I, I found that like, oh yeah, like I connected with that more. So I love what you said, because I do think that initially we want to have that support, but the, the, I, I feel like the group in general and any recovery needs to understand when we need additional support or when maybe we've sort of outgrown a certain modality, right? True. Um, uh, Bill Wilson uh, often said uh, that uh, we always must remember that we are running a spiritual kindergarten here. Uh, the point is to come in, to find the grace to go on living to better effect. Uh, but the yeah. point is to become, and I, I, uh, this is a different thing, I think, from as Bill sees it, uh, to become a part of the world that we once rejected and that once rejected us. That was under a, a quote called Citizens Again. In other words, um, we can get sober in AA, but we must live in the world. Mm, yeah. So tell me when you were working with these people that were suffering in sobriety, was there some common themes that you noticed that wasn't happening in the AA groups or in their life or in their recovery, you know, things that they were struggling with? The one thing I noticed when I I spent a lot of time after the meeting talking to people and actually observing Mm -hmm. what goes on in meetings is it if if you have uh, if you're privileged enough uh, to have seen groups evolve over decades, you begin to realize that half the people who go to AA, even uh, the ones who who do well in it, never really say anything in a meeting. They don't share their story. So when you go in and listen to people tell their stories in AA, they're getting you're getting a very narrow view. In fact, uh, I, I would say, I've told people, you could go to an AA meeting every day for the rest of your life and never really figure out how the people in that group are staying sober when they're not in the meetings. And so I would often question, so the, the common theme is that most people don't really understand what's happening to them. I mean, we're creatures that mm. think. We need explanations. Um, so um, they don't understand what's happening to them in their Um, drinking. They don't understand what's happening to them in their sobriety. Um, So they don't really even have an anchor anchor to start with. Um, Mm -hmm. I mean, the obvious themes that that are most commonly uh, talked about are the objections to God, um, the objections to um, that sort of thing. But I I, I worked with, um, there were certain people who, who 
seem to be gravitated to, uh, towards the things that I said. Um, born again Christians, militant atheists were two of them. <laughs> and I, and I, <laughs> or, or le- I must say, ex Catholics. <laughs> yeah. Or, well, yes. Um, uh, that, that, I had a bad probably experience. Probably a hybrid category up. between those two. Um, yeah. Uh, but uh, you know, but the, the thing about. A militant atheist is that in order to be uh, uh, militant, you have to be passionate, and that passion is what you can build on. So as far as common themes, unfortunately, every time I I would talk to someone new, I would sort of have to start over again. Um, It's Mm -hmm. always different. Um, And what I find is what people object to um, when I ask, what what don't you like about AA? It's never what they really don't like about AA. It's always something else. Um, And so... Um, there's no real, you have, when you deal with uh, people in the fellowship, or at least when I dealt with them, I, I had to take each one anew and sort of just forget all the things I've learned and speak to that person um, uh, um, as they were at that moment in time. I think it's interesting, though, how you come at it with not just the biblical God view, but also being a scientist. And I think that's important because you're all right when you go into AA, it's cunning, baffling, powerful, right? We're we're not really taught to understand addiction. We're not really taught to understand what's happening with our brains. I remember the first time my brother had a grand mal seizure. I didn't know what the hell was going on and neither did anyone else. Paramedics came. They were kind of rude about the whole thing. Oh, here's another drunk. I didn't know I was like 25 at the time, right? We don't talk about what's happening with the brain. We don't talk about like, hey, you know, the the reward pathways, like all this stuff I think can be very empowering. Like now that I understand the brain, I'm still a Christian, but I understand brain and, and, um, medicine and stuff like that so i'm very careful kind of what what i do do you know what i mean and 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 then it's helpful in the church as well because we can say look you can't you can't just stop drinking you can't you know like you've got to maybe get into detox or there's just so many things going on that i think that you know it's not all about knowledge but i think knowledge can be very powerful for some people some people don't care. They don't want to know. They just want to stop. Me, I was one of those, like, I want all the information. I want to understand the underlying trauma. I want to understand what's happening in my head. I want to understand all that. And I found that to be very empowering, you know. You probably guess I was the same way. I needed to know. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And yeah. What's, uh, what's interesting is that, um, you know, in, in, it, I, I tell people all the time that I, I learned quite a bit about what it means to be a human being. Um in the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. But I learned almost nothing about alcoholism, really. Wow. (laughs) Um, Wow. Now, that has changed, and uh, we talked about this beforehand, uh, between the 1980s and 1920s. And the 1980s was actually when rehabs first started. Um, Yeah. uh, I came in in 1981 uh, uh, after being in a – they had a psychiatric hospital that had an alcoholism wing. Um, and it played mm-hmm. out like one flew over the cuckoo's nest, and the alcoholic yeah, yeah, was I've... like the the bottom rung of the ladder, wh- below right. anyone else. They were in the basement. They were in they the were basement. In the ba- yeah, in, in New York, yeah. I read about it. Yeah. Yeah. And <laughs> so, um, but at the time, it was, there was a real sense of excitement and and, and optimism. Um, about the fact that oh wow, this addiction thing, we can learn stuff about it, we can do research. Um, yeah. But. Unfortunately, what happened is, is that at that particular time, um, people would go to rehab, um, they would learn a very sort of uh, benign, naive disease model, and then they would bring that into AA. And so there's been an exchange between the recovery community, the medical recovery community, and the and AA people. And of course, in my day, when you uh, sobered up, the first thing you thought about was, I have to be a career counselor in alcoholism. So you would bring your, you'd bring the AA into the recovery com- uh, medical community, and the medical community would uh, throw its patients back into AA, and there was sort of this population and interchange. Um, yeah. and, and, and now it's very difficult to, to separate um, uh, the moral models from the medical models for, for anyone to go in, in into uh, to try to recover now, um, it's it's not that there aren't resources. It's there are just such a bewildering 
array of things thrown at them from all sides, yeah. from psychological, from medical to moral. Um, I, I unfortunately, in I would say right now, uh, after 40 years, practically we haven't really made much progress other than confusing ourselves a little <laughs> bit more. And we've also lost that sort of spirit of, of real optimism, that, uh, that sort of pioneering spirit, particularly that Bill Wilson and, and, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, founding, like my uh, sponsor and the founding fathers of AA had. I mean, back in, in 1939, the idea that two drunks, two drunks could get together and talk yeah. to each other and increase the chance of both of them staying sober was considered preposterous. We, we, we forget that now. We, we forget that yeah. because self-help groups and, you know, uh, uh, the 12 step model has been, a, you know, there are probably 120, 130, maybe even a couple hundred different uh, mutual support groups. We forget what a novel idea that was uh, uh, in, in the 1930s that, that we would. Uh, the, of course, you had to defer to experts, of course. The person who could help an alcoholic would be a doctor or a psychologist or something like that. And then Bill Wilson comes along and says, you know what? Our families don't understand us. The doctors don't understand us. The church don't understand us. You know what? Why don't we just help ourselves? And that's, that's to me, the real spirit, yeah. the real spirit and the legacy uh, the the uh, almost American inheritance that was given to us. Um, you can talk about the 12 steps and the fellowship. You can talk about the big book and all that. But that seed, that initial optimism yeah. that, that we can help ourselves when other people have abandoned us, that's just... It, it just it gives me shivers just thinking about it. And and the fact that I'm I'm only one step removed from that through my sponsor. So Wow. There, I have like so many thoughts about that. One of the things that's popping into my mind is so when we look at like the addiction recovery centers and things like that, you're right, they get so caught up in the science, right? And that stuff's great. So, so like when someone comes in, you would do like a biopsychosocial. So you're looking at the biological issues, the psychological. So all those things are important just to determine the risk factors, right? So this person's homeless, so we need to address that. This person is bipolar, so we want to address that, right? So those, so that science stuff's important. But then there's like you said, the moral model, which. To me, as a Christian, I adopt that because I look and I say, well, um, if we look at this, if we go all the way back to original sin, we see that our brains are are corrupt under the fall, our biologies corrupt, like we're all, you know what I mean? So we're all groaning under the power of sin. So there's so many causes, but what you pointed out was something super you know, what I call not just, it's, it's love, it's connection, it's just, it's love, right? And I was sitting in um, for a large treatment center that I was at, and they had gotten this big grant, okay? And the grant was designed so that the nurses could call people and see how they were doing. <laughs> and, and you know what I mean? And it was this big idea that, you know, and I'm sitting there as a, as a believer, as a Christian going, yeah, it's human connection. It's love. It's like, we've forgotten about that. <laughs> you know what I mean? So what you're saying is, so, so, you know, AA finally came together and said, you said basically, yeah, there may be all these causes and all the genetics and all this stuff, but at the end of the day, we have to, we're, we're wired for connection. We're like Jesus, right? We love one another. And that's, that's, that's the, the root of it. I think that's ultimately how we get better. But I do think that you're, that the scientific community does tend to forget about that. And then when they come up with something like that, it seems revolutionary. And people like you and I are going, yeah, yeah, <laughs> right? <laughs> well, when I talk to uh, people, I mean, I've also done some, some consulting with uh, some rehabs, prominent uh, rehabs. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, I, I like to tease them a little bit and, and call it the hyphenation disease, the biopsychosocial. Well, why don't we add yes. another hyphen moral? Why don't we add another yes. hyphen yes. spiritual? You could go on yeah. 20 or 30 hyphens, and guess what dissolves, dissolves the hyphens? Connection, love. That's, yes. that's what yes. dissolves the license. You need to look at the person. Yeah. It, it's, it's sort of astonishing 
that the way they say, um, and remember, I'm sort of one of them as, as a scientist, um, we say yeah. that in order to understand the entire human being, holistic, it's a, it's a nice little buzzword, we have to break yeah. it down into a 20 or 30 Whole different person parts. approach. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. And it's good. It's good. We're not, we're not knocking it. It's just like you said, it, like I've done shows on what causes addiction. And just like you, I add the, the, um, the moral and the spiritual, because I think that's very important because what causes addiction? Yeah. All of it. We live in a physical world. We live in a natural world. We live in a scientific world. We live in a spiritual world. It's all there. It's all happening. It's, it's, I mean, it's complex. There isn't one answer. There just isn't one answer other than I believe God is, is the ultimate truth, but there isn't one answer. He created a very complex universe, you know? Yes. And, and, um, I'm a big believer in research for research sakes, because you never know where the, um, the research, the data is, is going to leave you, uh, lead you. Yeah. Uh, but, um, I also come into, um, my understanding of the science to me the science just gives me more reverence towards the universe yeah. so there's usually uh, at least two types of scientists probably more uh, but i call them the pocket protector scientists the guys who you know the stereotype of the, the lab coat and who uh, accumulate data and and then there are yeah. the people who are moved by the data. I mean, you uh, said I'm a pharmaceutical chemist. When I was working in the lab, I, I was more like a high priest of the laboratory. I mean, it was just extraordinary <sighs> to just to think that I could, and most of the drugs I worked with were chemotherapy drugs and oh, uh, long-term wow. palliative care drugs. So um, it was extraordinary for me to think that as a result of what I'm doing, I'm actually manipulating uh, through the knowledge that is given to me matter on the ultimate level, breaking bonds and reforming them to create things that it can actually alleviate human suffering. I mean, wow. how more religious yeah. can you get than that? <laughs> uh, yeah. 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 Oh my gosh. Wow. That's, that's so true. You, you can see, you can see God in the science, you know, just even looking through a telescope and all of that stuff. It's truly amazing. Well, all the great sure. scientists were, uh, I mean, well, not, I'll just pick the two. Newton and Einstein were both mystics. They were, they were both uh, yeah. uh, very much uh, appreciators of that, that extra dimension. And, and when you study it, you can't help but, like I said, be uh, a rose is more beautiful because I know what the scent does. I know what the color does. I know how it fits in. You know, so we have a lot to learn from just the roses. You know. <laughs> yeah. Well, Michael, tell me a little bit about your story. Are you an alcoholic, an addict? Do you identify with that? Did you go through recovery? Talk to me a little bit about your story. I know you had mentioned through various, you know, when we were emailing that your dad was a pretty bad alcoholic. So you came from an alcoholic family, it sounds like. I, I no longer identify as an alcoholic. That can be um, quite empowering in the beginning. Um, the, mm -hmm. the best place to talk about this, particularly since we're talking about the intersection of science and religion, is is that, that my story is basically uh, bookended by two events, one that happened at age seven and one that happened at age 67. And the one that happened at age seven <laughs> I talked to you about was... Um, uh, I just, I have to interject and say I love that because seven is the biblical number. So there you are, seven and 67. All right. Uh, I didn't do it on purpose. These, these are just the facts. <laughs> yes, yes. So at the age of seven was when um, uh, we're in the particular church that I, uh, it was Catholic church. I think it had some Greek Orthodox influence. It was in Newfoundland, Canada. Um, uh, confirmation and communion were the same week. And in between the weeks, uh, in between the two days uh, in which we had First Communion and Confirmation, um, I signed this pledge. And the pledge reads, I have it, but I don't have it in front of me, so I'll paraphrase. For the honor and glory of God and God's creation, and to make up for those deadly sins created, committed by people who use liquor wrongly, I promise to abstain from alcohol to the age of 21. Okay. I'm a seven-year-old, okay, wow. and I am signing a pledge to not drink to atone for the sins of people who use liquor wrongly. Is there a better setup for someone 
to be an alcoholic than that. Oh my goodness. So for eight was, years. Was there, who were you, was it just the people around you? Was it a family member that made you do that? Oh no, this was, this was part, everyone signed one. Everyone in my, uh, there were 26 of us uh, first graders and we all signed I mean, that I mean, I mean, who was drinking? Was it a family member? Was it your dad, did you say? <gasps> or or well, people around you or? The, the reference to the pledge was just anyone. Just, oh, you know, any, okay. any, All you know, right. the, it's just basically, uh, uh, it, w it was an abstinence sort of um, culture. Um, it was part of the coach church culture that uh, kids who were uh, had their first communion and confirmation take a pledge not to drink into the. Uh, they were twenty one. Now the wording oh, that you do okay. that you you do it in order to make up for this atone for the sins of people who use liquor liquor wrongly. Um, that's just add on. That's that. That's that was just, your add on. Uh, th okay. That's just okay. what they added on. Um, and it was. So I wasn't raised in in any church, so that's where I I was like, what is that? Okay. Well, so actually, that actually, a lot of people have said. Of... I, I've actually heard one uh, woman at the church I go to said that's like child abuse, isn't it, to, to make a kid <laughs> do that? But just think. So for the next eight years, yeah. from seven to fifteen, I am completely obsessed with not drinking. Not oh, not gosh. drinking. It, 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 it occupies, and of course, at this time, I want to be a priest because um, it was the, the strongest role model I had. My dad drank daily. Um, oh. Eventually, uh, um, there was no real abusiveness. Every once in a while, he overdid it. Um, yeah. He, he, uh, he gave up uh, drinking on his own uh, for health reasons. Never gave up smoking, though, so that was another addiction. And he died of emphysema because mm. he couldn't give up. Uh, his uh, three uh, packs of uh, unfiltered Paul Malls every day. Oh, my um, goodness, yeah. So, but as far as I'm concerned, just think about this as a child who is completely obsessed with not drinking, okay? Um, and we talk about causes of addiction. We like to look at trauma, and we like to look at things like, uh, but but there are multiple causes. Addiction can, can, uh, can gather together many unrelated sort of causes in a child and come together. Yeah. Uh, usually around 15 or 16 when uh, when you're going through so many physical changes. So by the time I picked up my first drink at 15, I was off to the races immediately. Um, wow. There was, and so for f 10 years from age 10, uh, 15 to 25, it was essentially just a rolling series of blackouts. Um, now that's one end of the story. So just a minute. So I'm not drinking to atone for the sins of others. Okay. And then at the age of 19, my mother dies. Okay. Uh, which is fairly early. And, um, I left the church. Um, mm. why is, um, I don't even think I need to explain why people do it all the time, particularly, um, the same reasons that a lot of people leave Catholicism, but 44 years later, years later, I come back. Um, and remember at 19, I'm not 21 yet. So I never, ever drank the, uh, sacramental wine, the chalice. I never took the chalice as a young adult. So at the age of 67, okay, I am now, um, using alcohol as part of the service of the mass to celebrate that Christ has atoned for our sins. I mean, you can't make this kind of movie script up. So, oh. yeah, so this you have this bookend of not drinking to atone for sins of others and drinking in a ceremony to celebrate someone else atoning for my sins. Um, and when that happened, the reason I start with this is that when I came back and was able to put those two together as sort of completing the circuit of, 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 of one life, um, I was able to see everything in between those two, including my, the times I was drinking and the time I was not drinking. I was able to see those from a completely new perspective, a luminous sort of invigorated perspective. And everything in life that before had seemed rather random. Um, I was not a case of self-will run riot. I was a case of self-will gone on vacation. I, 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 I drifted. <laughs> I never really knew um, what I was doing, or at least I didn't think I was. And yet now, when I have the perspective framed by the church of these two events and look back on my life, I see just a, a life that was just beautifully orchestrated for me. 
a life in which I was able to experience the material and the physical. And also, I think uh, what God gave me most of all was the gift of meaningful suffering in the sense that um, all the things that I had experienced through my drinking um, now became of use to other people. Um, yeah. Because my story right now really, I sort of get it. My story really isn't of much use to me anymore. But is it of use to other people? That's the interesting thing. And that's where I'm at in my life now. Um, now, I do. Ha there are two events that happened uh, in between those two, one at, at, at age 25, I had an absolute shout it from the rooftops, um, spontaneous remission of my alcoholism. It just happened. Boom. Taken away from me. One minute, I, I could not imagine a life without alcohol. And the next minute, I knew I never had to drink again if I didn't want to. And it was that dramatic. Um, and so for 15 years, I stayed sober. But the fact that you don't have to drink again doesn't mean that you won't. So after 15 years right. of sobriety, I went out again for about five years. And I experienced a completely different addiction than anything anyone warned me about. Um, wow. When uh, uh, they often used to say, uh, the old timers of, of whom my sponsor was one of them, they often used to say, if you go out drinking again, we don't really know what's going to happen. Every, uh, the, the story now is, of course, if you go out, it's going to get worse. What happened was is that it never even approached the external severity of, of what I experienced between 15 and 25. But it was much more dangerous because it was more subtle, much more mm. subtle. Uh, the things we talk about in the big book, the, um, the mental obsession, the phenomenon of craving, the mental blank spot, they're real shapeshifters. Um, and what I've been privileged um, to experience was, and I wouldn't call it alcoholism now, I would call a relationship with alcohol that goes from the age of seven to the age of 67 that has shape-shifted, that has changed over time. And what we do now is we take bits and pieces of our stories and we offer them up as the whole story. And right now, I'm fortunate to be able to tell the long story of how, and, and, and what makes alcoholism and, and addiction to me um, much worse than we think it is, is how deep its roots go. And the fact mm. that it just seems had to have a knack to resist change. Uh, it changes on its own. You think it's this, it becomes that. You use this treatment, well, and that doesn't work anymore. So that's the, yeah. that's in a nutshell um sort of my story wow and i think it changes because we change exactly you know, we're growing we're evolving you know you can take a medication that worked 10 years ago and then all of a sudden oh it doesn't work anymore what happened well your body changed your your you know neurons changed your you know all that stuff changes right we grow we evolve so this is kind of cool so you left the church you came back what was it that brought you back into the church uh instinct in fact when i've um, I've, I've written about this and i started out the chapter like a loggerhead turtle returning to the beach from which it was born i returned to the church mm. after 44 years there was no real reason other than the fact that in my heart and in my soul and in my mind and all the other little hyphens we want to do to break me up into little bits and pieces i never really left i left the church but i never left god never you still believed you weren't you didn't you're what you weren't one of those people that said i was i was wounded i'm renouncing my faith you just kind of walked away from is what it sounds like. Yeah, well, I walked, I walked, yes, I, I just walked away from it. And, uh, you know, I could get, it was um, the last mass I went to at the age of 19 was the, the funeral service held for my mother. So, you know, you don't have to read too much between the lines to you realize, you know, losing a parent at 19, um, yeah. you know, and I'm left with my father who's, who, who doesn't have any uh, better idea of what to do than I, I, I did at the time. Um, you know, we, we both just sort of had to take care of ourselves. We didn't really know how to take care of each other. Um, so there was no real, you know, throwing down the Bible, ah, hogwash, n none of that sort of stuff at all. And when I came back, uh, the interesting thing was 
uh, just walking into a church, it was like I could just feel it, feel it in my bones. It just, it was like, yeah, this is, this is, I remember this. This is, this is home. And then when I took the chalice for the first time and drank the alcohol, it was, it was very odd because I could also refill all my drinking again, almost in the first sip. It's like just, it, it, you know, that, that sort of flashback that they, they mythologize about, you know, right before you die, you see your whole life. Well, once when I took that sip and, I re, and, and it was just such a wonderful thing because the, the passion uh, of Christ is, uh, is, is something that I've always felt viscerally. Um, my uh, Catholicism, which is just simply a, a particular way of being Christian, and I would always identify myself as a Catholic because the word Catholic means universal. So the idea is that um, I have found that instead of um, you can gather more sheep by uh, saying instead of saying Jesus is the only way by saying Jesus has a way for everyone. It, it gets some. Oh, I like that. Yeah, it gets it gets some people over that hump a little bit more, and and then you, you don't come across like that. So um, the passion of Christ is always something I felt. The stations of the cross. Because that was always something yeah. I felt viscerally. So my, when I describe my re religious orientation, and I prefer spirit, I, I really do prefer religious to spiritual. Uh, to me, spirituality, as as it's uh, seen today on all over the internet, that's religion without a backbone. Yes, I just said it. Um, and the word religion comes from religare, which means to reattach, to reabind to the source. So, so for me, using that loggerhead turtle uh, imagery, I'm sort of reattaching to the, the source that was always there inside of me, even though I was gone for yeah. 44 years. It was like, it was like, I wasn't even gone 44 minutes when I, when I walked back in. Wow, I love that. Well, a day is a thousand years and a thousand years a day, says God or whatever. So he's just like, oh, cool, you know, uh, you're back. Well, that's, uh, that's a great story. Thank you so much for sharing this. I want to get back to sort of, we were talking about the moral aspect. You said, you sent me a quote that one of your goals was creating a language of liberation about addiction recovery that we've, and we talked about this a little, that bridges the humanities with the natural applied and social sciences, looking at what doesn't fit then you say spontaneous remission, relapse after long-term sobriety. Talk to me a little bit about what all that means. And you reference Romans 7, 15 through 25, which uh, for those of you that don't know, that's Apostle Paul saying, what I wanna do, I can't do, you know, where he's, he's wrestling with um, the sin that's living in his body. I do not understand my own actions, for I do not yes. do what I want, but I do the very thing that I hate. And then he goes on and on in Paul's sort of circular way, because um, I think it's important to understand about my interpretation of Paul <clears throat> is that he, um, he didn't start with belief and faith. He started with just an extraordinary, overwhelming experience of Christ. And then yeah, he spent the yeah. rest of his time attaching a theology to that. So the great thing about Paul is you get to see him figure it out as he goes along. Um, and, you know, that may not be a, a standard interpretation, but I love reading Paul. Um, and as far as starting with a language of liberation, uh, let's just look at what he says. Let's just strip it down to the basic thing. Forget about the sin, which goes uh, later in the passage, but what he says. I'm a human being. I want to do this. Yeah. <laughs> okay, but I do that instead. Okay, I don't want to do this, but I do this anyway. And yeah. let's just add a little alcoholism and addiction onto it. I mean, even when I realize everything I just told you, when I try to stop, more often than not, I actually drink more. Yeah. <laughs> or or I go on bigger benders. So yeah, let's just stop right there. Okay, now he, he attributes it to sin. Now, you, now I say, I call this the war within self. Um, yeah. And it's actually the banner on, on, on my I LinkedIn profile. Um, and there was a book called um, Man Against Himself that was uh, published in uh, 1938 when Bill Wilson was writing 
the big book uh, by a, a psychiatrist named Carl Menninger. And he says yeah, yeah. quite clearly that, um, and I know the quote, and I'm just going to paraphrase a little bit, um, addiction is not a disease. It's a flight from disease, an attempt to escape an inner conflict of unknown origin. Now, Menninger was a Freudian, so you know what rabbit hole he went down with that. <laughs> but 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 in a, yes, but in a yeah, but there's a lot of truth to that, and there's a lot of truth to Freud and a lot of weird stuff. Yeah, so, but you know. but in AA, <laughs> there's always been that that duality that that was hap- that was right. Or I said right around the same. That was in the common sort of milieu, intellectual milieu at the time. Bill Wilson wrote the big book, so there's always been that addiction is primary and then addiction is secondary, and both those things have existed in AA. Um, dualism is just ripe yeah. in AA. Uh, um, so uh, that's what I mean. If, if we can just stop right there with just simply realizing that the addiction is not just driven by craving, <clears throat> but it's driven yeah. by the battle between craving and not craving, between wanting and not wanting. The brain does not care whether you want or whether you don't want. It prefers that you do both because that means you're always thinking about it, which actually makes my childhood experience with that oath. The fact for eight years I was obsessed with not drinking as any alcoholic was with drinking. Um, and there's a, now you want to talk about how the science comes in on, on this. We have our scriptural reference, a language liberation that starts Let's forget about all the theories. Let's just start with wanting versus not wanting. There's a, a primatologist named Robert Sapolsky. This is the quote. There is nothing more addictive than the notion that there is a reward lurking out there, and it's a maybe. He studied the dopamine levels. And dopa- oh, my gosh. And what happens is the dopamine levels peak when you think there's a reward, but you don't know whether it's going to happen or not. So yeah. every time an alcoholic picks up a decide, you know, oh, never again, and then starts, you never know. You're throwing the dice every time, which is one of yeah. the reasons why gamblers are, are uh, it, it's such a difficult thing. So we have a, a scriptural. <gasps> it's going to be different this time. It's going to be awesome this time. Yeah, but it's you that know, ambivalence. Yeah. It's that not knowing yeah. one or the other. That's what really drives the addiction. Um, so if you stay with that, then what happens is that a theologian, a Christian can say, well, the cause of that is sin. Uh, a guy like Sapolsky can say, well, the calls that is the brain structure of the uh, the structure of the primate brain. And economists can come in and they do all kinds of interesting things with hyperbolic discounting theory. They've got the, their own thing for addiction. A psychologist can come in and do something else with that. A neuroscientist can come in and talk about the triune nature of the brain. From that simple model, that's why I say we're t- bridging the, the, the gap between the humanities yeah. and the sciences is what you asked me to do. From simply that, so it's almost like Hamlet Redux. You know, it's not to be or not to be. It's to drink or not to drink. To do or not to do. To want or not to want. That's the ultimate human dilemma, and it comes right out of consciousness. Uh, you don't have to get any farther than waking up your eyes to, to be confronted with that dilemma, and you can see it everywhere. And once you start with that, then everyone in the humanities can put their own explanation onto that. Okay, but the but the most important thing is 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 um, what is that person experiencing at the moment they are trying to make that choice? And that's where I say it's almost the same for everyone, including people who don't self-identify as addicts and alcoholics. So in one way. This addiction is goes much deeper, much worse than we realize. But because it attaches itself to um, the consciousness that is part of all of us, it means that all of us have access to it. And it's sort of a reinforcement of what Bill Wilson said, that, you know what, let's for a moment forget about what the experts tell us. They tell us all kinds of different things. Let's just start with what we know about who we are and how we make choices. And so it's frightening. Addiction is so, it's frightening. It's, it's sort of the canary, the, I would call it, uh, as far as alcoholism, the drunken canary in the coal mine that's sending our, our species a message that perhaps we're assuming things about ourselves 
that we are still growing into. We assume that we have consciousness, but even Paul talks about uh, us being asleep uh, to the risen Christ. Uh, we, yeah. we talk about having free will, but I don't know about you. A lot of times I just I have that same thing. Why did I just do that? So I think that we're assuming that we have consciousness and free will, and we do have moments of that, but we're still growing into that. We need help with that. You know, we're, we're just a fledgling little species. Um, and in the United States here, which is the time place, we're a fledgling little country. So the, the idea yeah. of reclaiming our inheritance of freedom, that's something um, that all of us need to do, not only just in that, that moment when we make a choice, but each, each generation has to do that. I mean, AA, the story isn't told. I hate it when they talk about how the pioneering times are over. The pioneering times are now. They're here for the individual who wants to understand themselves. Because in each, each moment, they re-experience themselves anew. It's, you're, you're not a done deal. AA is not a done deal. America is not yeah. a done deal. Uh, humanity is <laughs> not a done deal. Not yet. <laughs> not yet. No. no. Well, well, we, we, can get, we can get apocalyptic and uh, if you'd like. But, yeah. Um, yeah, so, so that's another show. <laughs> yeah, so that's what I say about using the, the language of, of liberation, um, uh, which is a language that everyone can use, it's simply wanting and not wanting, uh, to bridge the gap and allow everyone to put their own explanation, but we all go in through the same doorway. So I know there was a second part of your question, but I'll stop there because I know I went on there for a few minutes. <laughs> so, yeah, some of what you were saying I got, and some of it was whoop a little bit over my head. I, I I will admit, but kind of I think what I what I glean from all of it, and what Paul is trying to say is really, you know, with without the Holy Spirit, without God, without understanding who we really are, we really are powerless. You know, when we're running on self will right that's where we end up is like on the floor in a fetal position that's where i end up without god i i it's like in my own strength nothing good usually happens you know i mean sometimes it does but but for the most part i can screw up my life you know and and like i like to say we're all we're powerless over sin, right? Admitted we were powerless over our addiction, admitted we were powerless over sin. You know, for some of us, it's addiction. For other people, it's anger. For other people, it's lust. For other people, it, you know, so it's, it's, we all have something. And, and I think that what Paul was saying was, was without God and without him, his power running in me, I'm just helpless. I'm always going to be reaching for something to to you know cover something else up to make me feel better to help me in this world you know like i'm just i i you know the world's too strong for us right with without god we're just look at look at where we end up you know yes and and i think the genius of paul in, in that particular message is that if you uh, and as a Christian, you don't want to, but if you just read those first few lines before he talks about sin, <clears throat> he's describing the human condition in, in a, um, yeah. a very stripped-down way. That's why I love the passage. Um, and I've quoted it to people who had no idea it was in the Bible, just that first sentence. I'm not going to give them the sin thing. Yeah. Um, so the, uh, so as, as Christians, you can use it that way. But that model of the war within self is so general that I think anyone can use it. Wow. So the second part of your question, which was about um, the what doesn't fit the model. So as a scientist... Oh, yeah. What were you meaning about that? Spontaneous well, remission. Spontaneous remission and relapse after long-term sobriety, which um, fortunately we've already introduced in the discussion because I've experienced both. I've experienced mm -hmm. spontaneous remission... And I've experienced yeah. uh, relapse or drinking again after long-term sobriety. I can tell you that they don't fit into any model that I've learned about addiction, any of them, psychological, religious. Uh, they have to be evaluated on their own as they are. As a scientist, and, and as a scientist, that um, makes me full of joy because a scientist <laughs> looks for things that don't fit. See, what we're looking now is, uh, unfortunately, I think what we're trying to do is to find 
one big explanation of addiction that covers everything. Um, but so, so kind of what you're saying is obviously in addiction, in AA and addiction counseling, we, we don't see spontaneous remission because typically we're working with people to get there. And then we, we, see, um, we see relapse in the beginning, right? Relapse after relapse after relapse until we get sort of stabilized. But we don't often see relapse after long-term <clears throat> sobriety, even though, well, you do hear about that in AA a lot. You know, the guy was sober for 30 years and then he wrapped his car around a telephone pole and killed four people and you know it's always something very dramatic like that but is, is that kind of what you're saying that those well are, those actually are no actually but that... i'm glad you pointed that i mean uh that's not inconsistent with what i'm saying but i never i didn't okay. really think of, about it un until now is that those particular things that don't fit the models but were actually um common i i would say that yeah anecdotally about one out of ten of, of every um person who recovers from addiction it's a spontaneous recovery um there's some studies that suggest that's about right it's not a number that i need uh, you know that to need to stick to um uh so but when you're saying and it never really hit me till you just saying how important that is 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 the people who are running the show the business part of it um don't see the two anomalies that would really give them information that they're not seeing right now. Um, the, the place we are right now, I talked about uh, in the beginning that my work was at a particular time, a place, and with a certain group of people. And the reason I started with that is because God sometimes hides the big message in the little details. Um, and so in those particular stories of people who um, have those spontaneous remissions, and, and some people who, uh, who relapse after a long period of time, we find some details uh, that tell us that where we are right now, I think, as far as the addiction recovery community um, in the United States at this particular time, uh, we're beginning uh, to have what um, Thomas Kuhn called the paradigm shift. Uh, it was a structure of scientific revolutions back in the 60s, I think it was 60s, that he introduced the term. It's been <clears throat> maligned for a long time, um, used. It's, it's fairly common. People have heard the, the uh, term paradigm shift. But what happens right before one big idea sort of cuts through and makes sense of everything is this proliferation of confusing ideas and theories. <laughs> and that's, yeah, exactly that's exactly where exactly we're right where we now. Right? It's called the yeah. pre-crisis the, the pre-crisis yeah. before the paradigm shift. <clears throat> oh my gosh, it's all of those things. Yes. No. Yeah, it is. It's yeah, exactly. And so, first yeah. of all, I can I I know clinicians, and there is they're pulling their hair out too. They need to keep <laughs> sort of a front up because their livelihoods depend on it. So you know, uh, but they're just you know like. We've been studying this thing, like just say, let's just since the 1980s, just because that's when the research started. We've been studying this thing for 40 years. Or, uh, it, it doesn't seem like it, more people are getting sober. In fact, we can't even treat the people who are. You know, is our knowledge doing us any good? Um, we've got so many things. We've got so many different treatments. We've got EMDR. We've got all these sorts of things that they seem to help a few people. Um, yeah. so, so that they're confused on that end and just imagine, uh, I mean, when I, when, when an alcoholic in the 1930s, they were walking around just like, wow, I, uh, I guess it's hopeless. And then someone comes along and says, Hey, guess what? We got this group and these people are actually getting sober. That alone, that knowledge, uh, would be enough uh, to, to just motivate some people. Now addiction is such a part of the vocabulary that someone just walking into AA and not knowing a thing about addiction or alcoholism is, is, is almost impossible. I mean, they'd have to have been living yeah. under a rock. So, so imagine the confusion not only of the, doc, of the people who are trying to help, but also the people who need help. Um, yeah. and, and I think really historically, and I, my training also as a historian, as a, mainly history, uh, history of science, um, as an undergraduate, um, where we are is right at that moment where one simple clarifying idea could allow 
all the rest of it to arrange itself in a way that's understandable to everyone. And I would suggest that I think it's been laying there for a long time. Uh, Paul talked about it 2,000 years ago. Simply back off. Uh, what we need now is a little humility. Let's not be wedded to an arrogant need to understand everything all at once. Let's just yeah. talk about that wanting versus not wanting and what it means to want to do one thing and to find yourself doing the exact opposite, not just as addicts, yeah. but as human beings. Let's start with that. Stay with that for a little while. You know, to, and, and one of the things that's attractive about those theories and as creatures that think, we do look for explanations and even convenient ones. Mm -hmm. Because to face the humanity, to face the fact that we are at odds with our own intentions is so horrifying at first glance. <laughs> yeah. But it's also quite liberating if you yeah. let go. I love that. And I, I think you're right that we're, we are kind of on the cusp of something. And in some ways, it seems like it, it, it should be obvious, right? We talked about holding a lot of different things as true. But also this idea, I always think of it, you know, when they talk about human-centered and person-centered and all these sorts of things is, is really, and I think you kind of capitalize on this at the very beginning of the conversation, is really just listening to the individual. You know, one of the big things now is autonomy and all that stuff, right? Where it's really looking at, I don't have the answers to help you, but I bet deep down you do. Exactly. <laughs> you know, and, and I think that's really just the biggest, the biggest challenge that we find is like when I came into recovery, I had no sense of self. And the, the person that helped me the most was the one that empowered me to make some choices. And once I began to make a few choices, I understood that I was able to do that. Because that was one of those things that when I came into recovery, I didn't believe I had the power to make decisions based on my past and things like that. And, and for other people, it could be something completely different, you know. And so it's just looking at the, the individual, right? And it's going to be different for everybody, you know. Uh, the sense of self is interesting. I, I would say I, uh, my original sort of take on that for myself was that I really didn't even really have a desire to make decisions. Um, but it's all, <laughs> right. but, it, but it, I, I really didn't. Uh, it was just easier to let things happen. <clears throat> Fortunately. And then, uh, yeah, then you could blame the other person for it. <laughs> well, yeah, you could, but, I mean, <laughs> uh, you could, you could do that. But um, uh, the interesting thing about letting things happen is that, that, you know, now in retrospect, I mean, that's the short view. Uh, you know, anytime we look at our life, we're looking at a cross section. And one of the advantages now of, um, and, and the reason what I'm doing now is, is trying to put together that story from um, 7 to 67. One of the most interesting books that's often forgot about now about uh, alcoholism was The Natural History of Alcoholism, uh, 1995 by George Valiant, in which he followed 600 men, admittedly a, a limited study, but from a central early age to um, late, late age, uh, and followed the, the as the title said, the natural history, the progression of alcoholism. And about five or six years ago, I noticed that academics were getting very interested in what they call longitudinal studies. And instead of a cross section of 600 uh, people, um, maybe we could have one long story. So when I asked myself, right. and this is a story, uh, ask myself at this stage of my life, um, do I have anything left to offer? Who can I offer it to? Um, and in what form can I put it? Uh, what I've answered for myself, and a year ago I wouldn't have known this. Uh, before I came back to the church, I wouldn't have known this. Uh, what I, the only thing I really have to, to, to uh, offer at this point, only, of course, um, is um, that long story is my own story. There's, there's nothing extraordinary, more extraordinary than an ordinary human life uh, lived yes. out. And uh, yeah. so this is the first time, by the way, I've ever talked about that long story, uh, uh, certainly in public and to anyone, because um, I, I prefer not to tell my story. 
Uh, but I, I, I did it here because I thought it was important to me because I think it's, um, it's important for other people to hear it. No, I agree. I mean, I think that, you know, our stories are what we've learned along the way. Our stories are what shapes our life, our recovery, and that's just so important. So, well, Michael, it's been over an hour, so <laughs> we could probably, I, I, I know I'm looking at all the things I was going to ask you. We probably didn't even, you know, get to all of it, but um, it's been fascinating talking with you. Thank you so much for coming on and, and sharing, and I love this idea of, of bridging, you know, the science with the spiritual because i'm i'm both you know i look at addiction as a disease because i watched my brother die from it and it was a disease and he did have a disease but he also had um a spiritual problem and he did have a sin problem and he did have a lot of emotional problems and he did you know so when we look at like the biopsychosocial i say yeah you know it's all those things and to me holding all those things in one just makes sense. I know it's hard for a lot of people that have, you know, their brain is like, you know, they want to categorize everything into one different thing. But I, I think embracing all of it and still understanding that God is sovereign is, is huge. It's really important. And I think that, um, I think we hit on that, you know, um, so yeah, some of what you were saying was was above my pay grade. <laughs> like I, I I was trying to track with you though. I have two master's degrees, and you're still you're brilliant. I'm like well, really the, sure. the problem I find is is well, you you'll have a transcript. Believe me, it's not. Uh, so it's not. <clears throat> I've polished. No, I love it. I love I, I've it. told I, I, these ideas. I've talked over and over and over again. I've thought over and over again. But more often, uh, I've engaged other people with them so so i've, I've developed uh, my own language of liberation uh, yeah. uh, hopefully a way to express these things mm -hmm. clearly and i always uh, try to do uh, uh, the best i can in that particular sense and yeah. um yeah. you know our stories uh, i tell people it's not, it's not just my story our stories include other people's stories and every time i meet someone yeah. and talk to them i go now you're part of my story so jody now you're part of my story <laughs> uh, you know, and, and, and so, and, and yeah. that's important. Just kind of in closing, maybe just advice for people listening that are suffering, that are, have, have tried different recovery models that, or maybe haven't even entered recovery. They're listening. Maybe, you know, I always have people send this show to family members that are struggling, you know, someone listening, you know, that's, that's wanting help what's well, kind of some advice you might give them because there are a lot that you know while it's confusing today there's a lot of help out there t as well which is great well actually that you've uh, oh you couldn't have segued more beautifully because i i thought about this because as i know i knew you were going to ask this was their your final question Yes, that's usually the final question is is hope hope and help okay well i'll go back in there you know i'll go back with a very quick anecdote, it's 1982. I'm picking up my one-year chip. I asked my sponsor, <laughs> "What uh, what, what am I supposed to say?" He says, "Be honest and be brief." <laughs> mm -hmm. And so um, he expected me to go only 15 minutes instead of the whole hour. So I got up <laughs> and I said in front of my home group, um, "I said I stayed help I stayed sober with the help of a few of you and in spite of most of you." And then I sat down <laughs> and they looked at me and then they started uh, big blank stares and then they started laughing and they applauded because they knew exactly what I meant was that it just had to sink in. It, it, it just took a moment to sink in is that that God will always provide you, uh, at least in my case, a handful yeah. of people. That's really all you need at any given time who have your back, yeah. who want yeah. you to get better. And the rest of them just don't care because they've got their own lives. It's not cause, uh, necessarily because they're evil or because or they don't want to help, but they've got their own things. And so I've never been in a time in my life where I didn't ha God didn't provide um, at least a handful of people who, who would have my back. Um, and so I would say as my advice is that it's there. The people are there. Yeah. 
You won't recognize all of them. Or you might miss a few. You also might I invite in a few people probably shouldn't have invited in. However, if you yeah. pay attention, the resources are there if you look for them. That's mm -hmm. what I would say to those who are suffering in their sobriety or suffering in their alcoholism. Yeah, that's perfect. I love that. And then I would, I would also just say, um, continue looking. It doesn't always happen on the first try. You know, I think we feel like it's got to be a perfect fit right away or we're crushed, you know, and, and just think of it as like if you're looking for therapy or anything, it's just like anything else. It's, it's, it's kind of like a business. It's like if, if you're looking for a good lawnmower, you know, you got to find the right fit. And when we're hurting and wounded, that can be very hard and triggering. Um, but you just got to keep doing it until you find the right fit, you know. So, um, well, Michael, thanks so much for hanging out. This has been a really cool conversation. I had a lot of fun. Um, are, can people get in touch with you? Are you cool with that? Do you want to give out any information? My contact email, information website? is on LinkedIn. All of it there. Okay. Uh, including my email. Um, and, and so um, people can contact me through that um, anytime they want. Okay, and it's Michael, M-I-C-H-E, uh, M-I-C-H-A-E-L, and then the last name's Cassette, but it's not spelled like Cassette. It's C-O-S-S-E-T-T-E, -T -T -E, right? right? It's, uh, uh, it's, it's like the tape recorder, except with an O instead of an A, and I've said that probably 10,000 times in my life. <laughs> because most people, it's, it's but yeah, it's C-O-S-S-E-T-T-E, -T -T -E. think tape recorder and put an O instead of an A. And if you're younger than us, you might not know what that is. But <laughs> well, I'm I'm sure there are a few in the Smithsonian that people have seen. So yes, exactly, exactly. Uh, all right, Michael, thank you so much for being here. Thank you and for inviting me. Thank you so much, friends, for listening to Genuine Life Recovery, playing on your favorite app or on my website at jodystevens.org. It's J-O-D-I-E-S-T-E-V-E-N-S, jodystevens.org. There you can check out my podcast, blog, recovery coaching info, speaking, and more. Check it out.